Hello and welcome. My name is Celia Chimozamora, and I'm the Director of Professional Learning and Certification at Actful. As Director, 
I've had the distinct honor of being able to interact with educators from across levels, languages, and the globe on a daily basis. And the one thing I've found that we all have in common is that none of us are perfect. And we all have, at one point or another, failed at something, even our incredible teachers of the year. And that's what this panel is all about. Having been in the teaching profession for over 15 years, I can attest that teaching is quite possibly the most difficult job I've ever had. And sometimes it's a matter of survival. But we want you to know that regardless of the kind of day or lesson you had, you are always enough. Tonight, we're joined by previous Teachers of the Year and our wonderful host, Heather Sweetser, to share stories of instances when things didn't necessarily go that great in the classroom or in teaching, to remind us that we're all in the same boat and we're all in this together. Heather Sweetser is Apple's 2022 Language Teacher of the Year and she received her MA in Arabic at Ohio State in 2012. Originally from Minneapolis, Minnesota, she joined the Army in 1998 and learned Arabic at the Defense Language Institute, becoming an Arabic interpreter. Experiences with languages in the U.S. government inspired her to become a language instructor, focusing on intercultural competence as a core part of language fluency. Currently, Heather teaches beginning through advanced Arabic at the University of New Mexico and is one of the co-creators of the website, WeCanLearnArabic.com. We hope you enjoyed today's panel and remember that Actual is always here for you on your best days, your worst days, and every day in between. Without further ado, take it away, Heather. Thank you so much, Salia, for that very kind introduction. Um, I, it's my absolute privilege to be here with everybody today. I'm so excited to be joined by uh, all of you here today together, of course, and also our Teachers of the Year. So I can't wait for each one of us to introduce ourselves. Salia already did a wonderful job. Thank you so much of introducing me. But um, Ying, I invite you to introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Hello from California. I actually just finished my last, you know, class like 10 minutes ago. Yay, survived one more day. And um, yeah, my name is Ying and I'm teaching Mandarin Chinese uh, in the Silicon Valley high school, high school Chinese. And so happy to see everybody here and can't wait to see you and hug you in Boston. Thank you so much. I just typed in chat too. I messed, we had an order going and I already messed that up. I just want to put that out on the table there. So thanks for rolling with it. Um, Noah, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey, good evening, everybody. Noah Geisel in Denver, Colorado. I was the 2013 National Language Teacher of the Year. And uh, the one thing I would add to my bio that was scrolling at the beginning of the uh, show this evening is that during the pandemic, my wife and I got an awesome dog named Pepper. And uh, so that that's missing from my uh, bio is that I take my dad, my dog dad duties to Pepper very seriously. That's awesome. Thanks for joining us. And Rebecca, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Rebecca Aubrey. Um, so Noah, you introduced yourself as the, uh, you said I was the 2013 Actful Teacher of the Year, but no one will ever take that from you. You will forever be the 2013 Actful Teacher of the Year. So I am the 2019 Actful Teacher of the Year. Um, I teach Spanish in Eastern Connecticut. So um, Ying, I'm at the end of my day. I, 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 it's, I'm at the end of my day, that's all I'll say. Um, I've taught all across the pre-K through eighth grade spectrum and I'm currently teaching sixth grade and it's my sweet spot. I, I absolutely love sixth graders. And um, Noah, another connection, I do. I have two dogs and one of them loves to bark while I'm in Zoom meetings. So I'll keep muting myself when he does that. Thanks so much everybody for joining us. And of course, everybody else too. We know your time is precious. Um, so. Even after um, the conversation is over, we'd love to have you join us on Twitter or any other uh, anything else through Actful. We're, we're here for you. Um, so we'd like to just get right into it then. Our first question here, because one of the things we noticed as we go to conferences and we talk to different people is that there's not a lot of opportunities for us to talk about issues that happen. Some things we just want to say, scream from the rooftops, please, like, let's think about this issue that happens. Not in a negative finger wagging way, but hey, maybe we should take a harder look at this. So the first question is, uh, 
What is one common mistake language teachers make in the classroom? And what's your advice for how to avoid this pitfall? Anyone would like to start? I, I would love to jump on this one right away. I think that's something that I, I would love to see more people avoid is not having the audacity to believe in your own awesomeness. I think that you know sometimes we can get stuck on our imperfections and focus on you know everything that's not going well and you know I, I think that there's just such an opportunity to you know take that energy and you know focus on continued improvement and, and whatnot and growth but also to you know give yourself the permission to believe that you know that kind of twinkly tingling feeling you have that you know I might be awesome like maybe it's true right? maybe maybe you are awesome you because you probably are and and believing in yourself and giving yourself the confidence to you know, go ahead and share that awesome idea that you used in your class, but, you know, print it out, put it in your colleagues' mailboxes or share, you know, send them the link and, and nominate yourself for awards and, and to put yourself out there because you are great. And, and you know, hopefully you can see the awesomeness in, every, in yourself that everybody else already sees in you. What a wonderful, wonderful sentiment. I think this is very true. I, I I think a lot of us sometimes hear only the negativity. You know, did you ever see that meme where they have the student comments, you're great, you're wonderful, and then slowly the day goes by. And then as you know, you're lying in bed, you only remember just that one negative thing. <laughs> so I think that it's really important to be reminded of of these things. And yes, please, for the love of God, everybody nominate yourselves for everything. Um, anyways, um, Yang, I see your microphone's off. Would you like to Yeah. Type? I want to say um sometimes you plan a perfect lesson. You you believe it's a perfect lesson, but when you deliver it, it doesn't go as well as you expected. And I think at the beginning, I took it really personal. I was like, why? You know, I spent so much time doing it. You know, I thought about all the details, but eventually I just told myself, we're working with kids, you know, working with human beings. And there were so many factors that can really affect you know, a, a class. So I started to just like, I think just piggy, uh, piggyback on what uh, Noah was talking earlier. I start to say, well, not, this is not big a deal, <laughs> you know, not, not so big a deal. And if something I realize, I, I reflect and I realize I can change to make it better, I will do it. And another thing I, I learned was I'm going to write down my ideas right after the class if i think okay next year i will remember to do it trust me i won't forget so i i would just say you know sometimes give yourself a break and i don't want to say keep your expectation low no you still want to have high expectations but at the same time you know just maybe be realistic and just be you know be more understanding you know a lot of things can might affect you know, your, your class, your lesson, your class. Yeah. So I, I want to piggyback on what you said, Ying, um, because I find that often the first time I try to do something and I think I have this wonderful lesson planned and it's just, it's a complete disaster and, and it falls apart. And like the things that I thought were going to be really easy and take two minutes don't. And so then I'm rushing through because the really exciting part at the end, I really wanted to get to. And I, I like, I spent so much time on that. I don't want to lose it. And um, I think one thing that I'm trying to always remind myself, and I remind a lot of the newer teachers that I work with, that very often the first time you try a new activity or something new with the students, it's, it's not going to work because half of it is about teaching the kids how to do whatever that activity was or the steps or the process and getting them to understand it. And that part, that part productive struggle, especially as we're doing it in the target language is so much, is just as valuable as the content or completing the task that you wanted to, them to do. And so often when I talk to um, new teachers and they're afraid to try something, I say, it, it it's very likely it's not going to work this time, but that's okay. Like they're going to, then the second time they're going to know how to do it and it'll, it'll go much smoother the second time. I, I admire you so much for taking notes on um, what went wrong because every year I say I'm going to do that and I never do, I never remember. And it's so funny just this week, 
I was reusing a Google form that was based on kind of like interpreting some infographics and talking to each other. And I remembered something went wrong with it last year when I used it. And, and I, so I went through the whole Google form and I checked it all over and I'm like, no, everything matches up. Like this, these go to this infographic, this goes to this one. Everything's fine. It must've been a different Google form that had the problem. Well, it was one of those forms that um, automatically grades as, as like a quiz. And so I checked it all over. It was all great. And then the first couple of kids started to do it and they're going, um, I got, you know, I got a 19 out of 20. I only got one wrong. And I'm like, that's okay. That's great. You know, good. And then another kid, I got a 19 out of 20. I only got one wrong. That's great. And then finally someone comes over to me and says, Profe, I, I really think I picked the right answer, but it says it's wrong. And that's the point when I realized it wasn't the questions on the Google form that were wrong. It was just how I set up the automatic grading. And so if I had only taken notes last year, and would have avoided all that problem. So I gotta, I gotta be more like Ying and take notes on on what went right and what went wrong. That's a, I'm laughing because this is this is exactly what I was going to share. I never used to take notes, and I'm working with somebody um, right now, Dr. Emma Trenman, who is so organized and has really taught me to be organized. And so this was gonna be my advice: just write down the reflections because we think we're gonna remember that this quiz was, you know, didn't go as well as we'd wanted or this activity needed this tweak and like next year I'm gonna remember or whenever we do this lesson again or teach that chapter again or can do statement again. And I never remember. And I had an issue this past week where I wrote, I was looking at the reflections from last year because it just takes a minute sometimes. And I wrote down all, everybody's brain dead. This lesson doesn't work. <laughs> I'm just, they wrote brain dead in all capitals. And I just like, well, I must have had a terrible day, you know, October 6th, 2021, I guess, because it did not go well. But I wouldn't have remembered that. And I looked at the lesson and I thought, why was I, I mean, this was, this was a terrible idea. Nobody's going to get this, you know, that kind of thing. So it really makes a, it's made a big difference in my teaching to the point where sometimes I wish I could go back in time and just apologize to my students because, uh, yeah, just taking that moment every year it can get a little bit better. But I mean, I don't know anybody who's got just the wealth of time to do that. So for me, I really have to, had to train myself, just take a minute, you know, just write down a quick note before I even leave the classroom, even if it's just one little thing, like great, <laughs> post-it notes. Um, yeah. I, I like the stickies because like, I kind of had to laugh when you said to take a minute and write it down after the lesson, because I don't know what your world is like, but in sixth grade world, the lesson is over. And I have like this one girl, Hannah, who's 10 minutes later, still packing up her stuff to leave while the next class is trying to come in. And then somebody's in a bed, someone inevitably is crying. And then my phone is ringing because someone didn't show up to class or the nurse needs to see somebody. And then I have to go to the bathroom. When do I do that? I like the post-it notes though. The, the post-it notes is a really, is a really, um, a really good idea. Ying also said something though about the students. And I think, I think like all the reflections are good, but you never know year to year how things are going to go over with your students. And so something could go really well with one group of students, but then you have a different kind of cohort and it just, or a different class and it just goes completely differently. Or I've had experiences where it went horrible the first time. So I put all of this increased scaffolding into place the second time, but then it's too easy for the kids because they're different kids than who I was trying to scaffold for. You know? And, you know, a bit of a bird walk, but uh, I, I saw that one of the comments that came in from YouTube from Maffle was talking about, you know, making sure that you document the good stuff. And that just reminded me that of something that I didn't do my first couple of years, but that made a huge difference that, you know, to this day, I have a folder in my inbox called good news. And so not just like lessons that went well, but also just, you know, a student who writes a note, I take a picture of it, I email it, save it in my good news folder. If I get a good observation, a parent saying something, anything that's just kind of a positive, you know, kind of positivity uh, lockbox basically is what that good news folder can can turn into, and and for the days where you've where you've had a day, right? For October 6, twenty twenty one, Heather, right? Like you right, like to be able to get home and just be like, I need to just know that I'm awesome, and I'm just going to click on this good news folder, and, and you know only read about you know good feedback for a few minutes. And so if you, if you don't have a good news folder, I highly recommend it. So so we actually call them a warm and fuzzy folder in my school. Um, and I, every year when we have new teachers, I get one for them and I, I tell them exactly that it's, it's funny though, like from the, 
um, high school perspective, I guess, versus the elementary school perspective, what we tend to get are little sticky notes from students or, or, or funny little things that are more paper. So we, we have like a warm and fuzzy folder and I tell them to, to put all their warm and fuzzies in there and whenever they need to feel warm and fuzzy, they can just um, dig into that. I like that. These are amazing ideas. Um, thanks for sharing. Yeah, I, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to the next question here, um, which is, what's a mistake that you've made in the classroom as a teacher that, that you feel comfortable sharing? And then how did you get past this issue? I can go first if none of us want to talk about it. Um, because I can say, um, for me, uh, it's all about making learning fun. Learning is entertainment. I was very against this idea. I would say, I'm not your cruise ship director and all of this kind of stuff. I'm not here to help you navigate the, the Sea of Arabic in a fun way. Because, um, I, again, I learned at the Defense Language Institute where, you know, it's six hours a day, five days a week, 63 weeks. You do not get time off. If you skip class, it's called desertion and you go to jail. And so I joke with my students that I learned Arabic at gunpoint. And this is how I taught too, especially those first years, because again, I'm like, this is not fun. But really I've come, I've come totally full circle about this. Um, the, by coincidence, the former commandant and provost of DLI lives in Albuquerque and we get together on Fridays now and just talk about language learning. He was not there at the time that I was there. And he's got this whole system of learning based on brain chemistry and looking at how the brain works. And so in a nutshell, basically what you need to do is you, get, you need to get those dopamines firing in your brain. Because if you're, what you're doing is pleasurable and fun, you want to keep doing it. And there's no reason that learning can't be this way. Quizzes, everything else. I mean, you know, why, why not be a cruise ship director? Who wants to leave vacation early? You know, if you make the class kind of fun this way. So now when I look at my lesson plans, I mean, best practices are great and all, but I ask myself, where, where's the dopamine rush in this lesson plan? Because if there isn't one, then I've, I've got to put something that's fun in. That when students learning stops, they all want to go to the bathroom and they spend 30 minutes there and, you know, that kind of stuff, which we've all had. Um, that's when I make a note on my, for me, that I'm like, this was a bathroom lesson and I'm going to scrap it for next year. <laughs> I need to get those, they put the fun back in the classroom really it has become a priority for me in ways that it was not in the past. Do you know, I, I'm somebody who totally am happy to be the cruise ship director and be on the equipo de animacion. And at the same time, I, you know, something that it took me way too long in my career to learn was, you know, uh, that there's different ways of using humor. And um, I, I was way too late, um, just embarrassingly so, on figuring out that, you know, if there's, uh, if there's anybody who's the butt of a joke and it's not me, like that's probably a bad idea. And uh, it took me way too long to figure out that, that humor and fun is great. And, um, you know, it, it probably has led to a lot of really painful fasts for me on Yom Kippur, just, you know, kind of <laughs> cleansing my, my account for all of the times over just, you know, almost two decades of, of you know, before I figured out, no, it, like the humor needs to be strategic and, the most important part of that strategy is that the, the students are never the uh, you know the the on the receiving end of the joke. Um, can I just jump in? I think one thing I'm still working on is um, I don't want to use technology apps, you know, Kahoot or GimKit, just for the sake of using it. I think. For me, of course, when I see my kids, it's just so happy and, you know, they're, they're just so engaged in playing the game. I'm happy. But at the same time, I think I realize sometimes they're smart. They don't really process the information. They remember, oh, th when you answer this question, this is the right answer. It just or by color or by shape or by whatever. So it's not necessarily... Uh, serve the meaning of learning, especially, you know, when you learn a language like Chinese, you really need to read the characters to, you know, to be able to differentiate this character from, you know, other characters. So, well, it's, it's actually, it's really, sometimes I'm really struggling. Should I give them this just for fun or should I, you know, focus more and do other activities so they can 
really, you know, work on the characters learning or, you know, content learning. And I, I have to say, I don't have a perfect answer, but what I'm trying to do is I think I want to find the balance and I, I still give them this, those fun moments, but try to control the time. Don't let it go by, I don't know, one third of my class time. So it can be a quick uh, warm up, you know, to help them to settle and be ready to get into the mood of, you know, learning, get some, you know, effective uh, learning <laughs> done. And, and also, I think um, I also try to not just play the Kahoot. I try to go through the questions with the class. It's actually a way to check for understanding. So, you know, you guys, you did really well. You see, if I read the report, you got 90%, you know, accurate. Show me. So how do you pronounce this? What does it mean? What's wrong about that? So I don't know. I'm, I'm still learning, trying to figure out, but this is, I think something is always in my mind, how to find the, the balance, how to really, you know, use the tool wisely, effectively. It, it, it's it's funny. I, I've been thinking a lot about that lately as well. And um, it, it's funny that you're talking about a Kahoot because I did one today in class and I, I do use them. <laughs> I do use them as warm ups. Um, to, I, I always call it about like transitioning from English world to Spanish world. And I do try to um, make them be language chunks so that they're practice. My students are novices so that they're practicing um, the same kinds of language chunks and sentence frames. And I always have students read the final answer out loud, like volunteers to read it out loud. And we will process um, some of the responses and even quite simply, like how many students pick this response? How many students pick this response? So they're, they're practicing numbers and authentic um, context. It was funny though, today, one of my classes wanted me to play along with them. And um, I am actually like really bad at Kahoot. And so all the students were saying, um, she's going to win. She's going to win. And I'm going, I, I'm, you know, saying in Spanish, I'm not, it, it stresses me out too much. They stress it. They stress me out. And I, of course, didn't win because I was trying to go really fast. And I, and I like, I was at the top for a while and then I bombed and they were all like laughing, but it, it was, it was fun. But um in, in terms of technology, the other flip side that I would say is I feel like we learned a lot of really good technologies during the pandemic. I'm thinking, for example, Pear Deck right now, um, which we used a lot in, in my district um, to support our students who are at home. And when we came back from the pandemic, we were getting a lot of feedback to get kids off computers, to get them turning and talking to each other, give them paper and pencil, let's get them off the computers. They spent too much time with computers. And I almost feel like the pendulum in some ways swung too far the other way. I feel like there are some things that are really effective that we learned to use during the pandemic that can continue to support our teaching. And, and again, coming back to the to the Pear Deck, I really like it because the kids who um, have tracking issues to look up at the board and then to a partner up at the board and to the partner have it in front of them and they can follow along right in front of them. They can practice answering before they share it out loud to the class. So I, I agree with you that we need to not just use it for technology sake, but I also um, want to make sure that we're we're leveraging some of the, the lessons that we learned in the pandemic about how to use it effectively. Yeah, Rebecca, I'm so glad you brought this up because we talk about the pandemic as a very negative thing. And I think it's great to look at the positives as well, because for me, another thing that I've struggled with in the past is networking and just trying to meet new people and find some kind of common ground where we can share ideas and even possibly become friends. So for me, when I mentioned I met the you know, coming down a DLI, this would not have happened if it hadn't been for the pandemic. So I really started to force myself to talk to people, to be, which is ironic. I'm a language teacher teaching people how to talk to people all day long. Maybe it's just by the end of the day, I get exhausted with small talk and this kind of, I, don't, I mean, I'm not sure, but it's like, yeah, hey, yeah, it's, it's a huge personal milestone for me just to have somebody that we meet up with regularly to talk about language issues. This was not an, an easy thing for me by, by any stretch, but because I had to get myself out of this comfort zone of just talking to people. And again, like Noah was saying, like recognize the fact, maybe I do have some ideas to share and everything else too. Um, and even sometimes bad ideas, because it's nice to talk to somebody and just when well, he calls me out and everything, he's like, that that's a terrible idea, Heather, just please don't do that. And here's all the reasons why, you know? 
just to bounce ideas off of somebody before before I try them out in the classroom is, has been really invaluable. And that's a blessing that we have now because we can do events like this, for instance. We don't have to fly to a conference. We can all sort of join each other online, um, which I'm, I'm just eternally appreciative of personally. Yeah, and, and Catherine uh, dropped a comment in the chat about um, – she did not understand how easy it is to make something into a game. And so I just think that that's an, another thing that we sometimes do wrong, you know, is making things, convincing ourselves, I guess, that things are more difficult than maybe they are. But, you know, and instead of just kind of it, a lot of us as educators are perfectionists. Right. And so we can get hung up on getting ready instead of just getting started and then, you know, learning how it went and iterating on it. Um, I, I, I don't know if you if we want to move on or if you're okay with us sharing other ways in which we've just are embarrassed about what us ourselves as teachers. Right? And I have a bunch. Yeah. Um, Let's do it. Let's do some more here. <laughs> feedback's one for me. I, I think that you know just having no strategy for f feedback, you know, it made for me just it, it would mean that I was providing you know tons of feedback on every little thing which also meant that I hated doing it. And so I would take forever to do it. So it wasn't timely, you know, and, you know, so that by the time they got it, they'd forgotten they'd ever even turned it in. And so they didn't even look at all this. I'd take all this time to do feedback. They would take no time to throw it in the trash can right in front of me. And, um, you know, so it wasn't meaningful to them. It wasn't helpful to them. And so, you know, and it took me way too long to realize, you know, maybe I should just, that's where rubrics can help me. Maybe I can have be very targeted on, this is what I'm going to be giving you feedback on on this assignment. And then it feels less daunting to, to me to, to actually give it to them. And, you know, uh, like I will totally admit that I've had, you know, mid-December and, you know, mid-May or June, you know, roll around where I am, you know, cleaning, not even my office, but my home, you know, and I'm just like, well, Here's a stack of stuff that I'm just going <laughs> to select all full grade because I just didn't get it done and they don't even care. So uh, just totally embarrassing, but, but just poor feedback practices by me is, is a huge mistake that I wish I would have figured out earlier. I think I'm laughing. I used to have the same problem. I, I turned uh, something back to a student once and he told me it looked like a murder had taken place on his homework because it was just full of red marks. Um, that was that was the watershed moment for me when I realized maybe I'm maybe I'm doing too many correcting of, of mistakes here because again yeah the same thing that they just throw it in the trash and I feel terrible about it like I'm like the students don't care instead of you know reflecting maybe, maybe I'm the problem here and it's the feedback that they don't care about um, so yeah similarly I, I these days I just pick one thing just one one thing and I change my lessons too to where we'll have students talk for 20 minutes or you know we'll do the parent share. And I'll go around listening and then I'll stop the class and I'll say, I've noticed a lot of people doing something like this. Let's focus on this one thing, you know, maybe a pronunciation, maybe a sentence start, something that's larger and it's not picking on just one person. And then they go back and do it again. And that's how students are improving because it's right there in the moment, um, which works sometimes, not all the time, to be totally honest. It depends on the class. Yeah, no, I found that it, it gets a lot easier using um, rubrics and consist I consistently pretty much use the same rubric with students because they're proficiency focused rubrics. And because my I write them in student friendly language and because the students um, see them over and over again, eventually I can just ask them to to you know, kind of grade themselves on the rubric or assess themselves in the rubric. And then it gives us a, a starting point for a, a conversation. And so it makes it does make that that task a lot easier. Um, can I share another one of my worst practices? And it's, it's kind of, um, it's something I'm really struggling with right now. Um, and that is, you know, I, I we use backwards planning and I kind of start with these end goals. We have these thematic units. I, I know where we're going. And I often will find something that just looks interesting to build in or that I want to bring in. And then I realize that there's a little bit of language I need to help the, provide the students with so that they can talk about it or process it. And then, oh, wait, I'm going to add this in. And eventually I find that I'm going down this rabbit hole and I've completely deviated off course and I'm doing something that is completely um useless <laughs> like like it's not it's not supporting the unit and and especially when i realize like some it's fine when i do something like that and it's it's culturally enriching and it's it's adding like some nice event dimension to the unit 
or it's adding some sort of transferable language into it. But um, I, I hate it when I realize that I'm going down this this rabbit hole that's completely useless. Like there's no transferable language in it, and it's it's not gonna it's not going to go anywhere. I, I remember last year we we had a unit where we were comparing rural and urban schools, and my students didn't know the difference between rural and urban in English, never mind in Spanish. And we kept so we kept coming back to it and coming back to it, and I was finally like, what is even the point of this like wh why am i doing this and and so that's something i often struggle with is, is um trying to do something that's fun and engaging but then i have a really solid unit plan but when i accidentally start to deviate off task and making sure that i'm catching myself before it's too late and <laughs> i've lost like days of lessons down something that's not going to go anywhere it's very interesting, Rebecca. I was just thinking exactly the same thing. I think for me, I remember clearly when I started teaching, you know, many years ago, when I opened my computer, I didn't have a lot of, you know, files, activities. And I remember those days I was just so busy, you know, getting everything ready. And after several years, I realized that I have too many files, you know, for one unit. And Sometimes it is hard to let go of those files. You know, I spend time, you know, I put in my heart into designing all of these. Am I going to just delete it? Let, let it go? It, it is hard. But um, I started to realize that I can, what I can do is just to, um, to um, maybe do a, cos I, I hate to say cosmetic, but I, what I want to say to do a, a little tweak. Uh, I think one example um, I can share is that I have one uh, unit talking about, um, you know, giving directions. You know, if you want to travel, you go straight, make a turn, you know, that kind of thing. It became really boring. I, you know, it was like just drill, drill, drill. And then I just asked myself, is there a way? Actually, one of my Spanish teacher colleagues, challenged me she said what's the content you know behind the language itself can you give a content to this chapter and i got the chance to collaborate with you know other te uh, chinese teachers in my school district teaching the same level so eventually we decided to give this chapter a content and we uh identify uh the united nations um development um U uh, sdgs sustainable development goals because one one of the goals is talking about community so we're like this is perfect let's design a a, a task uh, about the community but kids have to use the uh, the language skill to say oh if i want to move from my school to uh, a, a senior center close by you need to go straight make a turn you know and i, I feel all of a sudden, this boring chapter becomes really fun again, because I think it's really, we put language and the world together. And actually the um, uh, summative project was um, to design a, uh, well, to give a proposal to city council saying that we, uh, based on the sustainable development goals, we realized that our community is missing maybe a recycling center, a senior center, you know, all of those. And we need to put this here, that there. And for senior people, they can travel, taking bus line. And kids got excited. I got excited as well. So I'm just thinking, I, I know it's a big challenge because we always tell our students to encourage them to be a lifelong learner. I think we we need to be a life we need to be lifelong learners ourselves. I know a lot of work, a lot of you know hair pulling, but you know, I think uh, at the end of the day, you, I at least I just feel so happy when I see their you know project and see how much they grow, you know, uh, in the proficiency letter and also as a um, you know, community member, they, they get to know the community. They want to be part of the community. That's amazing. No, it looked like you're about to say something. 
Well, yeah, I'm just sort of uh, Ying's comment about it being boring re resonated with me as well as Rebecca's comment about, you know, just finding yourself doing stuff that might maybe is worthless. And, and you know, I think that a huge mistake I've made just and continue to make it is uh, making it about me, right? That, that uh, I'm a woo person. And so I take it personal if I'm disappointing people. It, you know, it is a huge drag on me if they're bored, right? And so I, I take that on and, and make it more about me, frankly. And so it's, you know, it, maybe it's an ego thing or, or whatever it is. But, but at the end of the day, you know, I'm like, will be sometimes so focused on engagement you know, that I can find myself, you know, focusing on that at the expense of, of stuff that's meaningful, or, or I, I have a colleague who likes the word learningful. Um, and, and so I, a lot of times I'm, I'm doing this certain things at the expense of, of, you know, the stuff that actually matters. And and so that that's just a, a huge trip up for me, you know, my whole career, to be honest. Yeah, I'm with you there. Things I thought were so exciting and interesting, just because I think they're interesting doesn't mean my students do, and especially now I'm two generations removed from them at this point. The things that I think are fascinating no longer resonate. Like you mentioned directions, for instance, somebody, we were doing a directions unit and I thought it was really interesting. And they were like, no, nobody gives directions anymore. We all have, you know, Google maps on our phones. Like, what are we even doing here? And I'm like, you know, that's a, that's a good point. So we had that actually scrapping that lesson in favor of doing other things. And yeah, we'll still learn right and left, but just in, in different ways. Um, because for it was not it was not resonating with our students even even the lowest bit, um, despite all the games we played with chalk and blindfold and you have to get from one end to the other of a maze and you know trying to get TPR and you know total physical response in and all the things that I thought was super fun, not at eight a.m. on a college campus as it, as it turns out. <laughs> um, but in any case, we can continue talking about this, but I would like to open it up just a little bit too. If there's any issues anybody's having right now, and if you wanted advice from anybody, that's our next question. I believe is. Um, what is something you're struggling with right now that you maybe feel comfortable sharing with everybody that maybe you'd like some advice uh, from from the world, not just the us here, but you know, also in the comments too. So Heather, when I saw this question, I totally thought this was something that we're struggling with right now and that we needed yeah. advice with. Oh, yeah. okay. I thought you were asking yeah. for comments. Okay, okay. No, um, people in the comments can chime in too, because I mean, we, we might not have any answers. Uh, there's a lot of people watching who have great ideas too, and we welcome people to share them as well. Yeah. Um, I'm seeing uh, Linda Perilla says, um, teaching multi-level students. Um, it's, I, I'd be really interested in hearing some high school perspectives on that. And Linda, I'm not sure if you wouldn't mind putting in the chat, like what um, grade levels you're teaching, but, uh, Interesting, like in, in elementary and middle school, I feel like we're always teaching multi-level students uh, because students have to follow a clear track. You know, when they're in third grade, they can't, you can't put them into a first grade, okay, adult education. You can't put them into a first grade class because they just moved into the district. They move right into that third grade class. I, I, I mean, I had a couple of years ago, a student who joined a cohort in eighth grade who had been studying Spanish since third grade and he um, had never had Spanish before. And, and we just, we just had to, to kind of adapt to it. My, and I don't know if this helps, but my, my approach to that always has been to try to really focus on thematic units and that the prompts and the activities that I'm asking students to do are kind of open in the sense that they can um, talk about them and and work with them at a level that's that's appropriate to them. And I don't know if that if that helps or if that makes sense. But um, you know, I'm thinking right now we we're talking about what we really need to learn, and we're getting into some stuff about equity of access to education in Guatemala. But even quite simply, students were talking about what they bring to school with them and what they have to put in their backpacks. And um, I had students who were just able to give me really simple lists of words, like saying computer, my notebook, uh, a pencil, and that might've been it. But then I had other students saying things like, I have a pencil, I have a notebook, I have a computer. And then students saying things like, I have a really big computer, I have three notebooks. And so encouraging them to just keep pushing themselves at the level that they're at and that it's acceptable that we're all talking about the same topic, but different people might be talking about it in different ways and at different at different levels. And I and I like how some of those students who are producing more 
elaborate language then become nice models for the students who haven't heard it or they've only heard it from me and they're hearing it from peers. So it, it has a nice influence on them. I don't know if that helps at all, if that relates to some of the older students. I think it kind of like to chime in here because I'll be talking about this for um, a group of people in California whose acronym I forgot, I'm so sorry, it's online. But it's about content-based teaching. And so focusing on, just like Rebecca was saying, the content, whether it's something like what's in your backpack or what's your opinion about this political issue, sometimes people can just uh, scratch the surface and just say, no, I don't agree or whatever. And then the people who can get into it in more depth, this can help push people into learning more language that they wanna learn. Cause I have the same issue in my courses that we have native Arabic speakers next to people who have only been taking Arabic for 380 hours out of the 2,200 hours FSI says you need to become fluent. So there's huge uh, challenges with this. And I think this happens in a beginner course too, to be honest, even people who start at the same level, we've got students who just fly and take off with the language and others who just sort of stay here for you know weeks and struggle. So how do we differentiate in a classroom just in general? So just like everybody's saying, I mean, I, again, I, hopefully this is helpful, but finding a topic a topic that people are interested in, and by people, I mean your students, not necessarily yourself, maybe, because um, again, like the directions and, and whatever else. Um, I tried to do talk about religion one year. That did not go over well, because I could talk about religions all day. This is not a popular topic, as it turns out, for others. So, I mean, you, we got to pick wisely, I think, in, in that sense, too. But it can help. It can help to focus, instead of on the language, say we're going to focus and talk about this topic, the topic and then everybody's suddenly interested my native arabic speakers are no longer bored and my non-native speakers one they, they end up learning more about the topic and it pushes them to a higher level as well and this takes a lot of work i'd like to say though too it's not this simple magic bullet or anything like this um because it yeah it's almost like you have to set up your whole curricula based around one topic and that's a lot of work but again if you take it step by step little by little this this can really help i need help <laughs> Done, done. Uh, when, actually, when I started teaching in my school district, I got um, assigned two combo classes. One was a Chinese one and two combo. One was Chinese uh, three and four honor combo. And then, you know, the program grew and okay. <laughs> I, I haven't taught combo class for many years. But this year, I think the enrollment just across California drops. So back again, I got... I got assigned a Chinese one and two combo. And I think um, if it's a combo for upper levels, it I think it might be easier because, you know, like what you just mentioned, you can, you know, design work around a, a unit theme and maybe differentiate, uh, differentiate the tasks or, you know, you can rotate, you know, A year, B year, B year, that kind of thing. But for one and two, it was it was like holding two babies, you know, when you try to feed one baby, the other one is crying. And, you know, so I'm just wondering if the audience has any ideas, you know, I kids are wonderful. I have wonderful, wonderful 38 of them, you know, in, in one classroom. They're great. But sometimes I feel sorry. I don't give them enough, you know, time, enough attention to help them. So any ideas, please. <laughs> How long are your class periods in? Uh, we have we meet three times. Monday is 45 minutes and uh, Wednesdays and Fridays 90 minutes. Oh that, that's that's exactly like what my my um, schedule is like in, in sixth grade. And that's why you said something about Mondays before, Noah. That's why I hate Mondays because it's like this bang, 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 bang. All my classes, the same thing over and over and over again. Um, but I, I'm a big advocate, Ying, of, of doing stations. And, and mm. having a big uh, block of time like that really facilitates doing stations. And that's an easy way that you could differentiate and consider having some stations that are your teacher station so that you can meet with the students and meet them you know, leveled kind of where they're at mm. or, or even thinking about within a station activity, having leveled tasks. Mm. That's a great idea. Yeah. I, I love stations. Okay. 
Okay, thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to chime in on that. I am totally agree with Rebecca, and and I'm sure somebody will put into the chat the link to the Creative Language Classroom. Um, ways that they have just a wealth of station resources from you know probably close to a decade of blogging about it uh, that I would highly recommend folks check out. And I also think it's important to kind of name that a lot of times, you know we're told that it's a multi-level class, but it's really two preps in the same time period, right? And so I, I think it's fair for us to call it what it is that, you know, that, that, that they may say differentiation and yes, technically it's differentiation, but it's also two different preps piled into the same class period. I think that's okay for us to acknowledge, even if there's nothing we can do about it. Mm. Um, you know, and then the, the other piece that I would uh, add into that is, the notion around you know, just our, our the Afro can do's right that it, it those allow us to engage in you know whether it's a thematic unit or, or you know wh whatever the unit is it, it allows us to have kind of an on ramp for mm -hmm. learners wherever they are in their you know language learning journey mm -hmm. and in a, you know depending on how we frame it for them it, it enables us to do it in ways that really empower them and, and give them agency. Um, I, I think that going back to that piece of how we do it, there's, you know, all people who are way better at that than I am. Um, I, I could say that, you know, my, 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 where I, you know, my worst practice is, you know, trying to empower them and give them the agency and finding that they are a lot more comfortable with coloring books than the blank canvases mm -hmm. that I gave them. And so, you know, whereas I'm saying, go be awesome, they're saying, what are we supposed to be doing, Sinoshi? <laughs> Thank you, Noah. Noah, would you mind mentioning the blog again? We had a question here in the chat about which blog was that that you mentioned or website. Oh, I'm so I might be able to find a link here if we go to say I thought it was called Creative Classroom. Um, creative Classrooms. Kira Did you say Creative Language or, Classroom? Creative Language Classroom? Or is it Creative Classroom? I'll find a link. Give me a link. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. You know, it's funny. You, I feel like you just mentioned something about um, following the directions, and that's that's been my the biggest um, thorn in my side lately is following directions. Um, they don't follow directions, and I'm next week. I'm going to start hiding little treats in the directions. Like if you've read this far, come and see Profe, um, and I'm going to give them a candy or something. Like, like I don't know. <laughs> It's just following directions, like how many times they they get confused or get stuck and they haven't even read the directions. Yes, this was exactly what I wrote down in preparation for talking today. The thing I'm struggling with the most by far is people following basic directions. And I just don't know what to do anymore. And I read it to them out loud and I have a YouTube video where I describe what they have to do in case they didn't feel like reading. And then we talk about it in class. And then the next day, everybody's confused again. And it's something simple, like just attach your homework here. And this is, these are all the ways to do it. And, and it's not a technology issue. I mean, I have college students. So like I showed them how to use Quizlet, for instance, and one way to that's fun to study vocabulary. Um, and we've been doing this for over a year. And this is not like a surprise website. And it was a shock to all of them that you could scroll down in Quizlet. Like it's not just flashcards. I'm like, we. We have videos showing this. We talked about this in class. We we played this game. Like, what? Wh where have you been? Everybody. And then maybe this was like the brain dead comment I had earlier. I should not have insulted my students like that for their record. This is another worst practice issue. Okay. Um, so, is anybody else having this issue too with these just sort of basic directions? And does anybody have any ideas? That looks like it's all of us. <laughs> I I know again because I do stations. What I ended up having to do last year was um in their station each I each student had a job and one one student's job was to watch the time and let people know when when time was about up. But the the most important job was to read the directions out loud to the whole group. Um and I, I always state the directions. They have them on the table written, and I'm always like the first thing you do. It's, I say it in Spanish, 
eh, es muy importante, muy importante. Algo todos en the whole class says all together with me in Spanish, read the directions. I'm like, excelente, vamos, listos, adelante. And they go and start and like within two minutes. I don't get what we're supposed to do here. Did you read the directions? Yes, 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 yes. And so I'll go over and I pick up the directions and I read the first step and they go, oh. <laughs> um, as I indicated, I, I, they give directions. I'm just terrible at it. And in moments when I have, you know, patted myself on the back, it's usually, you know, shortly after observing elementary school teachers, um, because I, I think that they're just artists at, at this skill. And oh, by the way, thank you, Catherine, for dropping in the chat, uh, depending on which medium you watch us on, but creativelanguageclass.com is is uh, the button. And there, there's so many you know, great colleagues we have in this profession who are producing amazing stuff with stations. So th th that's just one that I have personally leaned on a lot over the years. But I, I think that, you know, one thing that I picked up on from observing elementary school teachers on, on the directions piece is, you know, not just explain it, but then calling on learners to restate the directions in their own words. And so saying, giving the direction and saying, so what is it we're about to do? And, and having somebody explain it and Maybe, you know, if, if maybe you even call on a second student to, you know, restate it in their words. And, you know, it, for me, it's going back to that um, humility piece and making sure that, you know, you're not talking about it. You, you make it about yourself. I, I know that I'm terrible about explaining things, but did somebody understand it, right? So making it about ourselves, right? And, and then that's, it's not that we're being boring by making the directions be repeated three times by three people, but it's because I'm so terrible. <laughs> this is really great. So we were almost out of time here. I just wanted to address like two things really quickly. One person had a um, question in chat. Um, what is your advice for digging yourself out of the hole when you know something's going wrong? You don't really know why the class isn't really getting it. Um, people are lost. There, you know, we've all had these moments where like, I thought this was great. It's not going well. Everybody, nobody knows what to do. Sometimes I just say, you know, forget it. I'm going to throw it out the window. I always have like a game that's like from that week. Where I just, you know, let's bring up this Kahoot. Let's, you know, forget it. Just kidding. Let's play Jeopardy. And then as we're playing Jeopardy and the students are thinking, I, I, I sort of reevaluate and take notes then. It's okay to scrap a lesson. If you don't get to be on to do that day, it's not, it's not the end of the world. So sometimes I just revert to review and students are like, oh yeah, I do know Arabic or whatever language you're teaching. Um, that's one way. But I wanted to really quickly, in our last couple of minutes, uh, if I don't talk about this for just like a minute, I'm never going to forgive myself. This meta conversation of, positives and negatives sharing best practices or worst practices, this terminology here, because we're language teachers, words matter, and I really, really don't like the term best practices. So worst practices in some ways, are, it's not any better. It's a pushback against this best idea. Because when we talk about best practices, there's no room for growth and there's no room for error. And I was really, really fortunate to go to multiple conferences this past year. I learned so much from so many people but I didn't hear anybody talking about the mistakes they've made or if they're presenting on a particular activity or a best practice, what are maybe the problems with it? There's no real venue for this. So I'm really excited we got the chance to talk about it today a little bit. We talk about, you know, mistakes are how we learn. I disagree. We have to recognize that it was a mistake maybe. I don't like the word mistake maybe, um, just, you know, learning opportunity, I suppose, but then actually do the work to correct it, just, just like our students. So people talk about these best practices like they're etched on stone tablets. No, no, humans made these and they should change with further research. But what's better than best? At the, I mean, we're already there, nothing, it's already the best. And so also too, more insidious sometimes, well, I, I love this job, I love what I do and I feel extremely fortunate, but I don't know any profession that's as scrutinized as, as we are. So I can't always espouse best practices because I'm human too, I, don't, I just don't have it in me. And if I hear self-care one more time, people suggesting this, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to lose it because I can't self-care rush out of Ukraine or whatever's bothering me that day. It's an issue. So when I hear best practices, like oh, I'm supposed to be the best. I don't believe in best practices or like a best teacher or a best anything, um, unless we're talking about God, I suppose. And, I, you know, there's a billion plus people who believe that God was sent down to be a teacher to us. And what did we do to him? We crucified him. So I think it's, we, we fall into this depression trap if we keep talking about these best practices and we have to give ourselves these rooms and opportunity for growth. I think it's really, really important. We have like 30 seconds left. Anybody else want to chime in? I I, I don't, um, I, I agree with you. I, I think those are all great points. I, I don't, 
I don't really like to ever talk about, you know, best practices, um, more kind of sharing things that have, have, have worked for me. I, I feel personally for me, um, I like looking at the acronym for the word fail as a first attempt in learning. And, and I try to practice that myself as much as I encourage my students to, to, to practice it when they haven't done something completely right or didn't do it as well as they thought with something to process it as, you know, this was the first try and you put in great effort with that. And I, I try to have those same conversations with, with other teachers as acknowledging what, what went well and, and, and how we can learn from it and continue to get better. Go ahead, Noah. Sorry. Go ahead. I, I just wanted to really agree with you, Heather, on the, on the part about, you know, a miss in and, in and of itself is not what's special. It's the rebound, right? The, and as somebody who is who just woefully, you know, just terrible at, at, at situational awareness and self-awareness, you know, I, I mess up all the time and don't even know it. You know, I, I have to rely on other people letting me know. You know, so so you know, I, I really think it, that that's an important part is that re, you know that recognition piece and, and using it to to learn and grow. So I'm, I'm glad that you you named that. And you know, I had not really noodled on on you know best practices being a, a problematic kind of you know way of describing it. I, I do think that whatever we call things that our ideas worth sharing that are scalable that, that others, you know, so that they don't have to figure it out themselves that, you know, I, I personally, you know, would have left teaching probably after three days if I didn't have, wasn't able to, you know, beg, buy, steal from, from what other people were doing really well, who are, you know, way better, you know, artists at the craft than I am. I think I will agree with Noah. <laughs> what, what I want to say is um, this just keeps, uh, you know, um, running around in my in my brain. Uh, my ballroom dancing coach once told me, in order to improve yourself, step one is to be aware of what you are not doing good enough or, you know, well enough. So I, I really think, um, you know, just some people might not feel comfortable with the word worst it might not be the worst but just realize that we have so much to improve you know we, we, we all grow from recognizing what is missing in our teaching or what we can do better in our teaching and eventually do it make our teaching you know better help kids learn you know more effectively i think that's the uh the ultimate goal so i, I totally agree with heather um you know the, the purpose for this conversation is really let people to reflect, think about what we can do, you know, to uh, to be a better professional, like grow professionally and personally to be a better professional. That, that's what I'm thinking. Right. But also to tie it into what Noah started this everything with is just recognizing how great we really all are already. There's already so much we're already doing. Yes, there's always room for growth. And yes, we can't quite attain best maybe ever it's not possible but what is possible is, is you know recognizing we're, we're all humans our students as well we have so much potential for growth and we already have so much capacity for for growth as well we've already all grown all of us a friend of mine told me we should always look back on our past with just a little twinge of regret because it's signs that we're growing as a person and as a teacher and everything else so this is a good thing if we look back and, and cringe because it's like oh you know what I've, I've come this far actually and i and i will hopefully continue to get better um, so I'd like to let's leave it on this note. Thank you. I know we went a little bit over time. I do respect everybody's time here today. Thank you so much for sharing this evening with us. If you're watching the webinar later um, recorded. Thank you for, for watching it. And thank you everybody for coming. We really appreciate it. We'd love to continue the conversation on um, Twitter, through Actful, everybody else. Um, we're, we're here for each other, ultimately. So thank you. Thank you again, everybody, everybody for coming. We really appreciate it.